back with another episode getting into the just career of strength and conditioning. We talked what, now we're getting into why. So in, in your mind, why strength and conditioning? That's a really important question. And when you think about your why and anything you do, it's a foundation of what you're going to be able to endure or even in some cases what you're going to tolerate. Because anything worth having is probably going to need some sort of sacrifice. And it's the, it's the shiny what that usually gets us attracted to something. But it's the why that gets us through that point where it really sucks. And that's the part I see with a lot of young strength conditioning coaches is the evaluation of why. You know, so that usually when I get someone in who wants to enter strength conditioning and they want to volunteer for me or they want to get an entry level job. I guess, well, what do you want to do? And, you know, you, depending on their, like, their social awareness, they'll tell you kind of what you think you want to hear. You know, it's funny to hear, you know, they're, 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 oh, this person's probably going to be more interested in me if I say I want to work in the private sector or I want to work in the team sector based off of where I'm at. And then it gets into this, like, you know, song and dance or, you know, like charade about like playing the image of what they think I want. And then I'll ask them why. And that's where I'll really call them on the synergy between your what and your why, because chances are, it's like, I want to work with elite level populations, or I want to work in the team sector. I want to work with division one football. I want to work with a professional sports team. Those are all shiny, big objects in strength conditioning, right? And it's not bad. I mean, I had the aspirations you did too, as well. Like there is a, sure. Like that's the first like thing that probably attracts you to this. And then you get into your why and it gets into, you know, range of things, which usually centers off around this like central theme of, I, I just want to help people. I would felt like I was underserved as an athlete. I felt like if I had a, an asset that was able to develop me from a strength conditioning perspective, or didn't, I uh, put me in compromising situations and doing things that were contraindicated and got me hurt. I would have been so much further along. So it's usually self-serving self-interest kind of usually gets you through. And that's that I want to be that extension of what I always wanted for someone else. So I, deep down want to help people and those are noble right and and then i start to ask about well where do you think the percentile help is with elite level populations and what is your skill set that would actually facilitate that and it gets in a whole host of other things of of well you know like i've been i got my master's degree or i've gotten you know these experiences or i went to these seminars and certifications and the truth is is you know they're already elite and they probably need less of actually all these things that you've acquired and learned and more just support emotionally and a little bit more guidance, a little bit more wisdom, uh, which are valuable for those populations because they're already fast, they're already strong. They're already incredibly skilled and athletic. Chances are your level of impact there is small, relatively speaking, toward the mentorship and worldliness and just wisdom. And that's why you see so many, so many seemingly uneducated not as qualified people work with elite level athletes because it's a trust factor. It's a, a level of, of understanding of what that person needs. We're just maybe not even just being arrogant or ego egotistical, which if you acquire more education, your ego kind of inflates and you think you're better than you actually are, which is not like, I'm, I'm living proof of that. Like, right. I, I think I'm the God's gift to strength conditioning. And I feel like I found the unified theory to training and I could probably cure about any single ailment or solve any problem ever imaginable. But it's not the, what moves the needle in terms of improving performance at elite level. It's my ability to communicate. It's my consistency. It's my lack of ego attached to communication with certain athletes. Like they're asking me a question. It's not probably because they want me to give them the answer. It's because they want to generally have a conversation and want someone to connect with. And they maybe feel isolated and alone. And this might feel contrary to what you probably believe working with elite level populations really is. And you should be very good at your job. There's no excuse for that. But going back to the, the why, if you want to work with elite level populations, you should probably work on people skills and you should probably work on how to manage things. And you should probably look at different, different careers that are just more specific to working with a pro athlete. And you might need to become a little bit more well-rounded in certain areas that you're not very well-rounded in versus, hey, there's a huge populace. Majority of the world needs your help. And one of the things that, you know, you see folks when they get to that critical juncture where it actually takes some sort of concerted effort as a coach to, hey, it's about consistency. It's about compliance. It's about execution. It's about doing this every single day. It's sending that text 
and 6 a.m. saying, don't forget to get your workout in today. Or, hey, make sure you come in there and get plenty of water in before you work out. Things that you take for granted are incredibly hard for the majority of the populace in the world. It's why we have a endemic problem of obesity and low back pain and all sorts of issues. We have to evaluate that there's a huge populace that needs your guidance and your help and that expertise. So if your what is working with elite level populations and your why is I want to help people, there's lack of congruence there. And that's the part where I start to really unpack of like, okay, well, walk me through again what you want to do. And then you start to go, okay, well, what level of impact would you have with someone that's already in a professional athlete? You manage, you don't develop at that level. And I'm not trying to degrade professional strength conditioning coaches because they are, some of them are some of the smartest, most capable, most competent people I've ever met in my entire life. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But the other end, it gets into this dynamic of their people skills. And the people that last in the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, are off the charts far outweigh whatever ability or knowledge I have in terms of communicating to those athletes. And I'm living proof that like, if you're not good at detaching your ego or your pride, you're probably not going to work with that population very long. And it gets in this like root of, all right, well, I did a poor job inventorying what I wanted to do versus why I wanted to do it. And I said, I wanted to work with elite level populations and I acquired countless hours and I'll say it directly, six figures worth of education. And I'm not exaggerating there. That six figures of education has very little carryover to what I'm trying to do with those elite level populations. And that very poorly developed skill in terms of communicating, having empathy, having compassion, having patience, being diligent in other areas versus I wanted to work with a group that could actually utilize my skill set and knowledge. And I wanted to be able to have a bigger impact. So a lot of times I get asked, why did I leave the team sector? To be honest, I probably thought in my subconscious, I should be doing more for the people I'm working with. And it took me about 15 years to figure that out. And now on the other end of it, I'm talking to young coaches about your what. Like, okay, great. That's a good what. Like, you want to work in the team sector. That's awesome. Or you want to work in the, in the private sector. That's awesome. Like, great. Then we get into your why. And your why is really the thing that's going to help you push through and get through. Why the average lifespan of a personal trainer or strength coach is, is probably 18 months or less for the most part. And I'm maybe giving a little bit of a exaggeration there because I've seen dozens, if not hundreds of uh, young interns quit in the middle of an internship at this point in my career. Because it's the realization of like, so we have to commit this many hours and we have to do make this many sacrifices all to make about 30 to 40 K a year and work 60, right. 80 hours a week and mm -hmm. sacrifice our firstborn just to be working with a team that doesn't really care about us being there or not. And they take, keep telling us that we're replaceable. You know, that that's the end here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hard, heavy realization. And that's part of the di the gig. It's the, you have to be humble. You have to be really, really focused on, I have the opportunity to help in some small but meaningful way versus in the private sector. And you have a person that just can't get over that, that hump of getting in three days a week for four weeks in a row or struggles with finishing a workout because they lose motivation or lose focus or always feels like they're not making progress. And you have to evaluate the 47 hours that they're not there in between workouts and it's those things that you're like, okay, I have a much, much more of a calling to that. And if I have a why to help people, we might need to go back and reevaluate your, your actual what. I remember when I first told you I wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach, you just lit me up. You went into me so hard. You're like, no, you, I, I did, just was not ready for us. Like, Tim will be so excited for me. Like, I want to yeah. do this. And you just went into me. So, but it was the best thing you could have possibly done for me in really helping me solidify my why and why I wanted to do it ultimately led me to where I am today. So thank you. But also, you shouldn't be a strength coach, you know, like I think that's yeah. the lesson there. Yeah. But so how is there, are, is there anything you recommend like young coaches or new coaches just sit down and work through as they think about what, why they want, what they want, like any, because I know for me, it's like, you got to level with your, what you want in your career, with your personal life. So how do you recommend coaches kind of work through that and find their why essentially? Yeah. Uh, I think first thing is your, your gut reaction, your instinct. Like, I, I mean, I've, I've talked about this before, but I pretty much spent 
all of my high school on a jam in some way. Right. And, right. and going to college, you got to find a real job and I, right, you know, I'm going to pursue this thing that's going to have stability and a future. And then you do that and you're not really happy with it. And then I found my way back to a weight room and I started doing internships and I immediately felt more comfortable. I felt more of, mm-hmm. I felt more confident. I felt like, okay, this is probably the area I'm going to make the biggest dent in the universe. That was like, I guess the first thing to work through, like, what is your, what is that feeling you have when you walk in a weight room? And if you're early in your career, if you're on the upward trend and you're excited and you have a little bit of, of man, like pinch myself, I get to do this. It's a pretty good indicator. The other part, it's the, you know, the, you know, the, I want to frame this in the right way. It's the, what is your day, your week, your month look like? And there's a lot more positive than negative. Because usually like this, it's all subjective appraisals. And if my job satisfaction is low and it's the right circumstance, it's working with people that are good natured or not like not, not trying to take advantage of you in any way. It's working at a a location or a place that's generally something where you want to be or live that your family or you personally really like being. And it's working with the demographic that you really like, but you still have a lot more negative. I'll be honest, it's probably not a, the job. It's probably you. And you probably need to figure out a place where you're going to find more positives, right? Like if if you look at, hey, I'm working a job that's just very simple, that I can just go to work, go home. I am essentially working to live because I want to do things outside of my nine to five job. That's a really important thing to figure out early. But it's usually the places that you are that are probably good on paper, but you're just making it bad in your mind. You found the wrong job or profession. Uh, and I think that part is, it's a little bit uh, a laggard indicator. Uh, usually you come to that realization way too late. And that sunk cost effect of, well, I've done this many hours of interning. I've done, made this many sacrifices, had this education tied into it. I think honestly, like if you can have an early appraisal of what's that internship experience like, what's that first job feel like? And if you're constantly like, man, this isn't, I don't want to do this for the next 40 years. It's, it's better to cut your losses and, and move on. But the other part too, it's the, and one of the interesting things about strength conditioning is there's probably not a more ravenous community for continuing education, for development. Their vacations are intertwined with seminars, right? Like I, I can't tell you how many seminars I, I've been to where I asked the coach, like, where is this family? Like, oh, they're at the hotel. They're at the pool. I'm just over here getting my yeah. learn on. And it's like, that's a very rare thing. You're not seeing that in basically anything else. You'll be lucky to get someone not do some something outside of their house, like on online. And yeah. people are traveling great distances, spending an incredible amount of money, usually out of pocket, and then bringing their families along because, like, it's doubling up for their vacation. It's the only time off. So in order to appease my family, I brought them with me. That's a very interesting and novel thing. And you look at that of, like, you know, imagine being that committed to it where your significant other and family goes, it's just part of the deal when we marry a strength coach. I think that's a pretty good indicator that, like, you're one really committed to it. And then the people that you surround yourself support you. And I think there's a level of subconsciously as well as like maybe this intuitive, Hey, I'm finding a partner that I really connect with and they appreciate and, and support me in that. It's not just when's this hobby going to be over. Like we can see right through this facade that you're not really committed to this. Like, I think there's a lot of support structure. There's a lot of good versus bad days. There's a lot of just general intuition. And the other part too, it's, it's okay to be good at something, right? Like, you know, if you're good at something, you do, you know, when you, you're out there and you feel more confident, like would I feel the same way if I was an engineer or a teacher, I don't think so. I think it would be very insecure. I think my confidence is intertwined with choosing a profession. I feel like I could be the best in, and I'm more willing to do the work and get the reps or pay the money or spend the time, continue to edu- continue to educate myself. I think that part is I'm excited about the process and the development aspect where I don't think it would be the same for another profession and that's okay. Maybe I have other things that excite me like my family or travel or just hobbies or things of that nature, but that's not strength conditioning, at least for me. And I think for the majority of coaches I know, and when you look at your why, I think you just have to accrue a lot of 
indicators that you're where you're supposed to be because this is what you're supposed to do. Sorry, I'm about to get the, the bell here real quick, but just just one question in terms of, you know, that's probably really good career advice in general. So how, I mean, you kind of got that gut feeling, but how, how else can people key into that? Yeah. So one thing I always find, and when I talk to young coaches, it's their body language, it's their presence, it's their excitement to do things that are trivial in some ways. The there's no job too small mentality. I think that part is a pretty good, good indicator. And one of the things I always tell people as young is if I don't feel like you're cut out for this, especially if you're volunteering, it's actually my responsibility to fire you. And you could probably argue that comes off as cruel. That comes off as, as mean. I think it's actually the opposite as a, as a person that, and this isn't tying my reputation, because I just won't recommend you. Like, you're not tied to me if you do a crappy job. Like, mm -hmm. I, I have nothing to lose if you do a crappy job. I really don't. I just, you got anybody? Nope. Like, I won't put your name in for anything. I won't say anything disparaging about you because you volunteered for me. But if I don't have an honest conversation about, like, every day you're, you're miserable. Every day you don't really seem committed to this. Every day it's like pulling teeth to get you to do the things that you're trying to, that you should be able to do, or at least try or trying to get better at doing, not saying you should be good at it right the first time you do it, but I'm saying there's probably an element of eventually you have to stay, start making some progress. And I think it comes down to you as an administrator or some sort of supervisor or boss has to have the confidence and the, quite frankly, the humaneness to go, this person's going to commit their life to this. And they have no understanding that they, they don't want to do this just for whatever thing they've convinced themselves of this, or it's some sort of product, productive procrastination, right? The hysterical thing to me is like, Hey, I want to do this in conjunction with pursuing this other profession. Like it ain't that kind of job. Yeah, it's not like that. It, it, you're just not going to be able to make, you know, supplemental income, go be a server, go be a bartender. Like those are way more, way more supplemental and transitional than strength conditioning. Cause there's too many people who are making this their sole focus and we're willing to make incredible sacrifices. And that part is a supervisor or just support structure, right? Like what is a, what are your peers reaction to you? Like, what is your, do they dump into you? Cause there's a element of, of time spent and energy focused on you. That is either net positive. Like this is going to make this department or this program or enrich these lives of these athletes or, make me better and maybe potentially have someone that I can employ later. There's that element. And then there's a whole other element of, man, this person doesn't have what it's take. I don't want to interact with them. They're just everything they say to do. They never do. They don't really care to do. You have a responsibility at that point to say, you should, you should quit or I'm going to fire you because this isn't going to work out long-term for you. And like, as you said, you know, I basically berated you for getting into it. You know, and there's also an element too of like, I think we have to be really critical with young coaches who have six figures of student debt that they're probably never going to get out of that debt being in strength conditioning. Now you, you're fortunate that you were able to go to a, a high level institution and have a scholarship. But if you're going to a school where you have six, yeah, six figures of student loans, your chances of ever paying that back on top of a mortgage, car payments, insurance, kids is about zero. Like it really is. You're never mm -hmm. going to get your head above water. And basically you're committing yourself to debt for the rest of your life. And I think there's a conversation around, like, if you really want to be a strength coach, you should probably went to a community college or two-year school, or go to get your four-year diploma, start getting experience and then moving on. We don't talk about this nearly enough, but the financial literacy aspect of strength conditioning, like, like that's a huge thing. Like you paid fifty thousand dollars a year to go to school, so you're two hundred thousand dollars in student loans. Like you ain't gonna make that back paying getting paid thirty to forty k a year. And I know that pressure is gonna loom on you. It really is as a supervisor, and you're constantly badgering me about, man, I gotta start making some more money, or I gotta start doing some stuff outside of here. Like I got bills, I got student loan to pay back, I want to buy a house. Like ain't gonna happen. Right. You might try to fast track some certain processes. And I think you should all be ambitious, but you know, as a whole, as an intern, 
like, oh man, I got a four year liberal arts degree that, you know, probably racked up a pretty high student loan. And you're like, I'm really going to do what it takes. Like, and you maybe don't have any college, college experience or no network. All right, this could be three, four internships before you can get a sniff at a team job. And that might be a 10 month position. Or if you find the, the unicorn out there of a, a, a grad, grad assistant program, we can get your master's paid for it. But those are dwindling as we talk every single day, you know, that like, okay, so you're going to go two years of interning and then make 12 K for a year. And then no prospects after that. It seems not a really so, good financial mood, yeah. but I think there's a responsibility as a coworker or supervisor. And if you, if you have that, why you, you would take like, I don't think you have what it takes. I don't think you have, I don't think you should do this. I don't think financially it's a good decision. Like we all have to you know, live with the decisions we make and have, have the direct outcome and consequences. And when you're 35 and have two kids and you can't afford a house because, because of whatever decisions you made personally, uh, I think there's, you know, okay. Like that's your choice to make. But if your why is there, you probably will be like the juice is worth the squeeze. I've been willing to push through. But I guess in a lot of ways, if you're not good, if it's not a good decision for your personal life and, and career arc, if you don't have a constitution, if you don't like taking feedback, you don't have a lot of humility, you don't have a lot of drive. I almost am responsible to tell you, you should quit. And if you react to that of like, I'm an asshole, I don't get it. I'm going to prove him wrong. I actually think that's a good thing. Right. If you respond to it as like, thank you. Thank you for giving me permission to quit something. Cause I was just yeah, hanging probably off. Do something you already wanted to do. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, you're welcome. Or, if, you know, like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to prove this guy wrong, but you still don't have any awareness that you're not very good at it. Like, or is not really a great longevity in it. And you're probably going to burn out in any way. So, you know, well, maybe I just, I did you a favor. You know, I probably tried to circumvent a long, hard road of not getting what you want. Cause you can see people who aren't very good. You know, there, there is a skill to this and some people do have a natural ability. Can you articulate what you want to do? Do you have to, can you convey confidence to a coach that doesn't have a lot of confidence in you to begin with? Cause you didn't play high level sports. Like, oh, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what the, the man in the arena feels like, <laughs> like, you know, that dynamic, you're like, sure. Yeah. But I do know how to make someone better. And I'm probably the best person in the world to do that. So you could choose to go with someone else, but I'll tell you, it'd probably be the biggest mistake of your career. Imagine saying that to a head coach, like yeah. that takes some stones, man. That takes some really, really high level confidence. And I don't think you just, you can, if you don't have that, will you be a good train coach? Maybe. Yeah. But man, it, when you get to that career milestone of like, I want to make six figures. I want to be a head train coach. I want to have this, this very coveted job. There's a certain level of confidence you need to have as an intern. And you could ask anybody who I interned for confidence was probably not my my weak spot. It was a point of almost overconfident where I felt I was a threat to other assistant strength coaches. And I was like, it seems like a them problem. That was my response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When my direct supervisor was telling me that they feel threatened by me. Like, it seems like they need to work harder, be better. If they're <laughs> threatened by me, that's not my problem. This is my reaction to that. That's why I got hired every single internship I ever did. And I think you get like success leaves clues. You know, people tell you like, oh, wow, you're doing a really good job. I need you. I need you to be here because you're a valuable contributor. Like, you know, and that's saying everyone's going to have that ramp or road or have that immediate gravitation to, but man, I, I, I go back to the first day I walked into an internship at Velocity Sports and I stuck to everything. I mean, I grew up in the nineties the where you were lucky to have a high school strength program that wasn't BFS and being gravitationally pulled to Gold's Gym down the road and saying that BFS program stinks. Sorry, Kim Goss, if you're listening to this, I doubt you are, but like that. I'm going to go ahead and wail on pecs on Monday, back on Tuesday, legs on Wednesday, shoulders on Thursday, Friday, arms. Like, I'm going to do that. And, like, then you get to a velocity sports and you get to, all right, you got to go over acceleration, top end speed, multidirectional speed. You got to be able to do Olympic lifts, plyos. You got to be able to do traditional strength movements. I had no, nothing involved with that. The extent of my athletic based program was dot drill before four workouts. Like that was it. If you don't know what a dot drill is, like just go on Google BFS dot drill. You'll, you'll have a, a field day. That was my extent of athletic based training. And that part, when you get exposed on that and you feel like you are so behind and you feel like this, this is going to be so daunting. And I was excited about it. 
in my reaction to like, well, I'm not going to be the weakest link here. So I get in there three hours early and I practice every single thing to the nth degree. Like there was no videos back then. There was nothing. I had to go through a manual and get a picture of what a icky shuffle was on an agility ladder. I had to get a picture of what an A skip was to demonstrate. I had to somehow figure out how to replicate that. And I didn't have cameras. We didn't have anything. So I just had to do it. I had to practice. I had to practice. Coach comes out like, that sucks. Like, okay. No feedback? Fine. I'll just keep practicing. And then you get that moment where the coach is like, Tim, demo. And you demo it. And they're like, okay, here's a coach. But it's not easy. Nothing's given. Everything's earned. And I still struggle to this day, folks, that like get what I call skill certifications. Like going to a certification to learn how to kettlebell swing, to me, doesn't make you proficient in swinging. Like I just, yeah. you got to rep it. You got to practice. Like, do you think anyone is good at kettlebell swings or Olympic lifts or like, I, I just find that's fool's errand of like getting a three day and immersing yourself in something where you're not going to get long term. Like I can demo every single thing cold because I practiced and repped it. Like, I don't need a warm up. I don't need to think about it. I'll go shit. You want me to demonstrate, demonstrate this because you put in the work. And what my point of this is, is there's a certain level of embracing being bad at something with the expectation you have for yourself of what you want, what you ultimately want to do based off your why. And that's the difference. It's I'm not good at this. How am I going to approach that? My why. And if I don't have a really solid why. And I'm not really good at something. I'll shy away from it or I'll just start to say that's no, not a really effective means of training. I can tell you something is bad, not off the pretense of I'm not good at it because I probably am good at it. I just don't think it's a value. And that's the difference because yeah. I'm putting the work and I'm putting the reps and I wasn't good at it. My exposure to this stuff is probably a lot less than most. And I still got in there and did the work. If anyone could see me in 2005 doing Olympic lifts, you would see probably one of the worst representations of Olympic lifts imaginable. We were taught to split clean in high school. And it turned into basically just a shoot your back foot out, drive your shoulders back. The amount of yep. herniated disc we have from, from our high school strength program. And we used to lock the doors and kick all coaches out. So we actually dissuaded any coach from interfering with us. So we could all max out on split clean on Wednesdays. That was Wednesday. I would lock the door, fire hazard. You know, I'd say we're all maxing out today and any means how doesn't matter how, as long as you catch it on your shoulder, you, you get a good lift. And if you miss, you sit over there in a the corner and you watch the rest of the alphas lift. Those are the, that's the environment I created in high school. So you imagine trying to re-engineer how to catch with a good rack, how to catch in a good position. When it gets really heavy, I still shoot my right foot back slightly. Mm -hmm. You could argue that's a left AIC something, but. The truth is that's a hardwired pattern of lifting like crap for four years and encouraging it and doubling down on it. And then you get to a point of like, now I have to completely rework that because Neil Paduzzi, a Georgia Texan, that's the worst clean he's ever seen in his entire life. Never do that in front of an athlete. I'm like, okay, do I have to get in here on my own on Saturday and practice this? Cause I can't do this in front of Neil. Like that's the stuff. And what do you say to that? Like my confidence was so, so, so through the roof. I'm like, all right, all right. Neil gave me some feedback. I'm going to go. He probably said along the lines of like, you should quit. And I'm, you're right. But I'm living in Atlanta and I have nowhere else to go. And I already paid the deposit and the, and pretty much the whole month, whole summer worth of rent. So I'm stuck and I got one decision to make. I just get better. Yeah. Let's go to really close. Mm -hmm. And probably because I took that feedback to heart and I worked and I worked through it. And I remember at the end of the summer, I was probably a person who used a demo quite a bit and I got hired. Like, I think that's a testament to that. But, you know, to be honest, like, if you get that feedback and you have someone telling you you suck at something or you don't have what it takes or you're not really cut out for this or, man, never demo in front of anyone or, God dang, man, like, you're just not good at this. Like, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good opportunity to determine your why based off your reaction to it. And as a supervisor, as a leader, it's almost your job to discourage your young coaches, see what their constitution is, because their why is... The really thing that should handle that. And their why is tied into their confidence. Their why is tied into their their tolerance to pushing through when it gets really hard. Their why is everything when it gets down to the point of actually making you a real strength coach. Yeah. Wow. We covered so much. This is this one got pretty pretty deep here. So 
That's Thanks, lot. Tim. If you're listening, you better figure out your why because uh, it might be a bumpy road out there. Or just quit. You know, just you probably yeah, don't. Yeah. Just quit. Man, that's just really it. Figure out your why or quit. That's like that's the two the two options there. Yeah. Quit. Yeah. Quit. Tim yeah. told me to quit. So just do everyone a favor. That's it, man. Yeah, let's let's <laughs> let's go ahead and let's go ahead and just reserve the spots for the for the real ones. All right, Corey. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. I'll see you. See you, Tim.